introduce to you Dr. Leila Almariati. I think I'll go up here because I have papers. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you all. Uh, I'm so happy to be here uh, to talk to you, or to give my perspective on the circumstances going on in Palestine right now with respect to the children. Um, the other day, Jim Bettendorf emailed me about a title, and I couldn't really think of one at the time, but as I was working on my notes and trying to, to figure out how to talk about a subject that we have been dealing with for so many years, and I see so many familiar faces. These are things, issues that we've gone over again and again. What, what do I want to say? And I, and I realize that when we're looking at the state of children, it's the question of why we still have to care. Because as the situation gets worse in other parts of the world, attention is, is shifted to other regions. We're looking at a very small population why do they matter enough for us to care, for us to be active, for us to take time to do the work to bring attention to this serious problem? So that's what I would like to, to touch upon and then hopefully have a discussion about when I'm finished. Um, so I'll start off by, by telling you about my own family. As Daryl mentioned, my dad was from Khan Yunus in the Gaza Strip. Has anyone been to Gaza before? Thank you, big for Gaza. Um, it's the kind of place that gets a bad rap, but once you've been there, you, all you can think about is when you're going to go back. Um, but on August 1st in 2014, during Operation Protective Edge, as Israel was carrying out its campaign to pretty much wipe out the whole eastern part of the Gaza Strip, uh, they attacked uh, uh, an area on Salah Hadin Road, which is the road that goes from the north to the south, as many of you know, the Gaza Strip is only 25 miles long and about eight miles wide at its widest. And they, they hit a house, and as everybody in the house came running out, they hit it again. And in that attack, they killed nine members of my family, including these six children. So I, I would have put a slide up, but I, I didn't know that, you know, I felt that I was, we didn't really have the, the projection to be able to do that. But you can look at this picture of, of these cousins of mine later. Um, I'll leave them over there. But there's six of them. And you can see their smiling faces and their cheerfulness despite living under siege and under occupation. But these are lovely young people who had a bright future until their lives were taken from them. What crime did they commit? Being Palestinian. But I try to remember them and think of their lives and what they were worth as I continue in my efforts to try to do something for Palestinian children and in fact children everywhere. So, but I, what I thought for the purposes of today's discussion was to look a little bit at the big picture and then narrow it down to the facts and realities on the ground. Because there's a reason why things are so bad and we can't talk about the situation until we sort of look at the context that we're functioning in. And right now there are these huge regional realities that um, are being discussed in Washington and at and think tanks all over, Rand Corporation, everybody is talking about them, everyone has an idea, nobody has a solution. The Syrian war is in its sixth year. Um, Iraq, has it recovered? Uh, the rise of ISIS, what that means for the entire region. These are issues that are on everybody's mind and there's a lot of interest and activity but not a lot of problem solving, I would say. And then as a result, this massive and forced migration due to conflict that is of the largest size since uh, World War II, that's having an impact on other countries in the region and beyond, especially in Europe. At the same time, you have continued challenges of poverty and disenfranchisement in the same places as always, such as Africa or parts of South Asia. In all of these situations, children are being negatively affected and being harmed, and even in our own backyard here in the United States. I probably don't have to talk about some of the challenges children face, and as working in a uh, community health center for low-income families and uh, as an obstetrician gynecologist, I have some awareness of that as well. So, so the problem is huge. And the question is, how do we decide who to help and what to focus on? And I think even for those of us who are sort of seasoned in this 
activism, that's still a question we can ask one another to help support one another in this effort. So even if we're not talking about anything new, I think we still need to help revive our own spirit in this regard, especially as political circumstances sometimes really weigh us down when things do not seem to be getting any better. But for the overall context, in my opinion, the situation in Palestine still has a global impact that affects geopolitical events and decisions that have far-reaching implications. It's not a little microcosm in its world that can come and go. It ha has a huge reach, and we'll talk a little bit about that. From the establishment of the State of Israel to the present day, the ongoing, systematic, deliberate effort to displace the Palestinian people and destroy their culture serves as an example to others who have similar intentions, perhaps, especially when Israel can act with impunity in its egregious and persistent human rights violations. So their function as a model for other actors in the world cannot be underestimated. So all of this has a detrimental effect uh, on the health and well-being of the most vulnerable members of the population, namely the children, who obviously will be ill-equipped to navigate the future and therefore contribute to the viability of a functional Palestinian state and national identity. So making things bad for children kills their future, makes them less effective as adults, and therefore now you've continued to wear down and erode this population who can't really mount a resistance anymore to your ultimate campaign of depopulation of the entire region. And if you can't depopulate it, you can do it in sort of a de facto way by making, rendering all the people who live there less functional than other human beings. So how is this accomplished? We're all familiar with that, with the occupation regime and the denial of the right of return and the imposition of apartheid conditions. I'm really focusing on the situation for Palestinians living in Israel, not so, I won't be talking about that as much, but West Bank and Gaza, we won't really be going into the situation for refugees abroad, but we'll talk about that just a little bit later. But many of you are familiar with the recent UN report on apartheid, right? It's amazing still that they actually wrote it, uh, called Israeli Practices Towards the Palestinian People and the Question of Apartheid. It's hard to find. I don't think you can find it on the UN website, but if you go to Electronic Intifada, they have the full report printed there. And the ultimate outcome, but I would say the ultimate strategy that makes the whole project possible in the first place, that underpins everything, is the dehumanization of the Palestinian people. I don't think we can say that enough. When we dehumanize somebody, take away their human identity, the verse we saw from the Bible is exactly the opposite of that. And we can say it, and sometimes maybe we get used to hearing it, and we don't really feel what that means. But when you treat people worse than you treat your pets, there is a huge problem for us as a species. So I think this, is, this issue, we talk about it, maybe we say it over again, but we should not get used to it because this is the underpinning of the whole project. It's why it works. Um, like I said, they are a role model for the international community so that dehumanization makes targeting of civilians and other conflicts tolerable and possibly even desirable. And if there's no consequences because we all look at them as less than dogs, what's the, what's the harm? If all the children are just gonna grow up to be murderers and thieves, we've done everybody a favor. I mean, that is the reality and there, that is the way of thinking that we're looking at. Uh, the other aspect is that other issues trump human rights and one of the most important is the economic impact. We just heard in the news about Bill O'Reilly, about time. Why did it take so long? What was the key factor that finally led Fox News to pull the plug? It was the advertisers saying, we're not gonna advertise with you anymore. So the economics are huge. What is the role Israel plays in economically has to do with information technology, military technology, things that they use and test, uh, international security, it's a huge, huge business. Everywhere you go, and sometimes you can't see it obviously, but it's right there. If you just look a little deeper, you know who's behind that in terms of the conferences or the uh, different meetings and so forth that talk about all these uh, advances. I have to admit, I used the Waze app to get here. 
The Waze app was invented or created by some Israeli entrepreneurs and it all functions based on GPS, the same type of technology that they use to do targeted killings, that's what they call them, targeted killings, which is also extrajudicial killings and assassinations of Palestinians in the a second intifada back in the early 2000s. Well, now I use that technology to get here. Uh, but that's what I'm talking about. This, the effect of this small country on the rest of the world is huge and can't be underestimated. So when we're making the case for why should we care, not only that, but as we always talk about, American tax dollars go to support Israel. But Israel is getting to the point where it could say, we don't need your tax dollars. And in fact, I think Netanyahu has said as much. But it has to do with, with other factors, I think, that, that have an impact that make this so much bigger than what it, what it may seem on the surface. So according to this UN report, the major methods in which this apartheid regime is established have to do with two basic concepts that I think really hone in on what we all know. The first one is what they call demographic engineering. And it's this change of the population. It's done in other countries too, for instance, in uh, China, the eastern provinces of China, um, you have large Muslim population, the Uyghurs and others that are there. Well, what uh, the Chinese did in the 90s and early 2000s was to increase migration or just population of the Han Chinese into that region so that it would reduce the actual total number of Muslim Chinese there and that would have an impact on their uh, culture as well as politics and so forth. So this is not a new concept. But we understand it in Israel-Palestine uh, of the issue between the law of return versus the right of return, right? And it all comes down to the demographic threat, threat, the whole nature of the Jewish state, which I won't get into. But it's this demographic engineering creating facts on the ground that make it, that, uh, that entrench this system and then make it really difficult, almost impossible to overcome. And we look at that with the settlement population continuing to grow in the West Bank as well as uh, Jerusalem. And also with the sort of confinement of a whole people to this tiny little place in Gaza, which is like, again, part of the dehumanization. Well, that's your Palestine. You could all go live there. Um, the other issue is the strategic fragmentation, both physical on the ground, as we talked about in kind of div dividing the West Bank up into these little pockets or islands, but psychological, this idea of the fragmentation of the Palestinian people. And they do that through annexation, occupation, and discrimination. And what are those four groups? Daryl mentioned them. But they're Palestinians living in Israel, Palestinian citizens of Israel who will refer to themselves in different ways. And, and we can talk about that as well. We have some in our audiences today. Palestinians from East Jerusalem, which is a very unique group of people, not very many. And, and the Israelis would like there to be even fewer. Palestinians living in the West Bank and Gaza were often talked about together, but really they're two separate issues now because they're cut off from each other even more than they were. And then Palestinian refugees or those in involuntary exile, or those of us who are part of this diaspora and are prevented from going. Um, so my most recent experience in trying to go, I went in 2013 when there were better relations between the Gaza government and the Egyptian government, I was able to take my uncle, but we had to go through the Sinai. We had to cross the Sinai Desert to get to Gaza through Rafa. It took six hours and it was kind of frightening, but alhamdulillah, thank God we made it there and back. Um, but this year in October, I went to visit my son who was studying Arabic in Jordan, and I thought I would like to go and visit Jerusalem. It's an hour, right? Or two hours. I'm an American citizen, I have an American passport, I was born and raised in Los Angeles. My father was from Khan Yunus, my mother was, is from Missouri. I'm a doctor, I'm a humanitarian. I work with Palestinian children. We sat in the, um, at Allenby for eight hours and then I was subjected to what felt like an interrogation but the Israeli officer, the young woman said, no, no, it's just an interview. But she asked me, <coughs> every detail about all the groups that we work with, the, all the list of our employees. She wanted to know every single thing, all of my family members, um, about my cousin who was waiting for me in Ramallah that I was going to meet. She wanted to know all of it. In the meantime, she's looking up stuff on the computer. Um, <clears throat> and at one point she says, well, why don't we just open your email and then you'll get all the names. Because I said, really, I don't remember everybody's name. And she said, so that was the first thing. 